Trinity One. We um, welcome to everyone uh, joining us online. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. We sing hymn 99 Christ <laughs> is the King.
My heart trusts in him and I am helped. Let us pray. We pray together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. Let us confess our sins and weaknesses and ask him who is rich in mercy for forgiveness and peace. So we pray, most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Because through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without you, grant us the help of your grace, that in the keeping of your commandments, we may please you both in will and deed, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Would you please sit for the lessons? Elijah flees from Jezebel. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also 
if I do not make your life like the life of one of those by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked of hot stones, baked on hot stones in a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and he ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. And that place came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. Elijah meets God at Horeb. He said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing there, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go and return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from Paul's letter to the Galatians. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are of Abraham's seeds and the heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gradual hymn this morning, number 353, In Christ There Is No East or West.
St. Luke, the 8th chapter, beginning to read at the 26th verse. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. They sailed to the region of the Gerizines, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him. And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerizines asked Jesus to leave them, because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This morning's readings are, I think you might admit, rather different from each other, and quite the challenge, really, for a preacher. From the story of the wicked and oppressive Ahab and Jezebel, persecution of their prophets, leaving only Elijah to hold the covenant faith, to that wonderful and radical passage in Galatians. Galatians 3.26, one of the few verses most people can name in that way because it is such a remarkable, remarkable verse in the Bible. When St. Paul declares that in Christ, there is no Jew nor Gentile, no male nor female, no slave nor free, as all are one and justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And then the man called Legion from Luke's Gospel and the Gadarene swine. Well, I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> Ahab and Jezebel is a classic story of power and corruption. A weak and vain king who's egged on by a powerful and a controlling queen. They famously eschewed the worship of the Jews and the covenant between God and his people as related by the prophets, and they sought the religions of surrounding nations, esoteric religions with cruel and hedonistic rituals, which notably held its participants to no moral sanction or moral code. The prophets, as part of their call from God, did not consider kings and queens, one might even say prime ministers or politicians, to be above the standards of morality, self-discipline, and mercy and justice that religion demands of all. Have mercy, do justice, show compassion. They're the central teachings of all the prophets, even for kings and queens. And Ahab and Jezebel bridled at being held to account by anyone. They slayed the prophets 
and Elijah fled to Mount Horeb, and God visited him there to call him to the next stage of his prophetic mission to save God's people. Spoiler alert, it doesn't end well for Ahab and Jezebel. That famous passage from Galatians is part of St. Paul's teaching about the difference for believers of their position before God since the coming of Jesus Christ and his resurrection triumph. Before Jesus, being pious, taking religion seriously, searching for holiness, was done by a careful keeping of the laws of Moses. Not simply the famous Ten Commandments that he brought down from the mountain, which found their way into the great Ark of the Covenant and proceeded around the country as a source of moral certainty for the people, and then later were put in the Holy of Holies in the Great Temple. But the detailed purity codes, notably uh, written down in the book of Leviticus and elsewhere, which impacted everything about your life, which detailed how a good relationship to God looks. It detailed what you could eat, what you must not eat, what you could wear, what you must not wear, how life was lived in every minute detail. It was thought that if you did this, then you would be righteous before God. Paul points out that since Christ, God has revealed a very different understanding, one based on a very generous and radical idea that simply trusting, having faith in the power of Christ to save alone justifies us before God. We need no ritual, no special dress or food, no circumcision. The old law which God gave his chosen people, the Israelites, for their use is superseded for those who have trust in the good news of Jesus Christ. But it's more than that. For this good news is good news for all people. Not the idea of a chosen people, but all of humanity can access this grace, can be justified through faith. So there are no distinctions anymore. We are all justified if we have faith. And it is so radical an idea that in Paul's eyes, it is the same as every distinction being removed such as male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. It's a radical idea in this age, but in the world of the Greco-Roman Empire, it must have been an extraordinary thing to say out loud. And the man called Legion in St. Luke's Gospel, it's a famous and a very vivid and disturbing scene for this poor man has been severely mentally ill for much of his life so that for his safety and that of others he was chained like an animal it's an awful thought and so many people who suffer have suffered in throughout the ages with mental illness and disability have of course fallen through the gaps and have often ended up living not metaphorically in the wilderness but in it. Over 70% of the people who live rough on our streets in this country have a mental illness or are suffering from a mental disability. They still live in the wilderness. But even his chains couldn't contain Legion, and he broke free and ran to a life of torment and loneliness. The ancient world, of course, had no conception of mental illness. Conditions such as schizophrenia and the awful torments of those who hear voices, who struggle to keep hold on the reality of their lives, was unknown. Even today, people are very wary of, other, of those who have mental illness, when in fact, in all reality, it is the mentally ill who have far more reason to be scared of the rest of us. When I was a student, I spent five summers working in what was then called an asylum. They were wonderful summers, working with various categories of people with a very wide range of mental disturbance, of mental capacity, and of mental illness. And I came to love that work very much indeed. I was always struck by how, when I was at work, 
how their world was hidden away from our world. To the extent that when we took them out for little trips around the local town, people were visibly challenged by the sight of our little groups. Some responded with kindness and came over to talk to our patients, who always wanted to be talked to and loved, loved engaging with anyone who would want to engage with them. And then as time went by, there was an idea that these residential hospitals and asylums weren't the way to go, and that the world, which for many of these patients wasn't perceived of as incarceration, but places of safety and community, but were of course expensive to run and ran against the tide of then what was considered to be the right way. They were always going to be vulnerable to cutbacks and they were gradually reduced and largely abolished. People were then liberated into the community, or, or so the rhetoric went. And this might have been a good thing, but it was always going to require far more support and far more consistent application of care, which as we know, has never been provided. So the result is that there are many people like Legion on our streets in temporary hostels and hotels, receiving inadequate care, profoundly vulnerable to abuse, and lacking the basic safety, care, and community that they deserve. In Jesus' time, of course, people interpreted these illnesses as proof of the possession by evil spirits. They saw all illness as, as some form of the expression of God's displeasure or punishment, either because you had done something wrong or possibly your ancestors had. God's displeasure with a person visited on them in the form of illness, physical or mental, is, thank God, not something we believe in today, well, at least not in all the world. Very sadly, the world isn't fully past this cruel and wrong understanding of illness, and much harm continues to be done in many countries because of it. Jesus calls the spirits out of legion, and they enter the pigs who rush to their deaths in another version. Of course, I believe Jesus healed legion, but I do not believe he was possessed by demons. It's a metaphor for being haunted by mental illness. Pigs were considered unclean in the ancient world. Their fate is more easily explained. So there you have it, my reading of three passages. I'm sure the clever among you could link them together much uh, better than I've tried to, but I think they stand alone um, as valuable things to explore. With due respect to the lectionary setters, I'm not going to try. <laughs> Amen. We stand now to affirm our faith in the words of the creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the maker of heaven, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father,
In the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to the Father. <coughs> Lord, we offer ourselves to you. Increase our faith in your love your goodness and your purpose. Enable us to see you working in ourselves and in others. Rescue us from cynicism so that we may grow and flourish. We have gathered together today to pray for your church throughout the world, remembering especially your church in Jerusalem, where there is continuing conflict, and for all who are suffering and in need of your prayers. We give thanks that we are able to worship freely when so many in our world are persecuted for their beliefs. And we ask you to protect those who risk their lives to spread your gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our We pray for our churches in the Nile Valley and all who worship in them, for Richard, the retired clergy, and all who help in this time of interregnum, and we pray that a new incumbent may be found soon. We pray for our bishops, Graham, Alan and Jane, for Elizabeth, our Queen, and for all those in Parliament. From our local calendar of intercessions, we are asked to pray for our district nurses who work so hard to keep us well in our homes. Give them the strength they need at this time of shortage of staff. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We continue to pray for Ukraine, for all who are suffering and dying, and for those who risk their lives to help. We pray for all who are caught up in conflict, political unrest, or corrupt regimes throughout our world. And we ask you to touch the hearts and minds of all leaders and politicians that war may cease and peace prevail. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We give thanks for our comfortable lives and the beauty around us. May we all do our part to stop the devastation that mankind has caused to our planet. We pray for the sick, the lonely and the afraid, the homeless on our streets, and all who have to rely on others for help and comfort. Help us to be aware of those around us and watch over our friends and neighbours. We give thanks to you for our mothers and fathers and family life and remember those who have gone before us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In our Nar Valley, we pray for David Kirkland, Gwen Wallace, Sarah, Amelia, Kelly Sanderson, Christine Rayner, Brian Rayner, Anna Lott Smith, Matthew Wise, Isla West, Stephen Miller, Julia, Glynis Fenwick, Richard Rappel, Catherine Statsika Priest, Karina Brooke, and Vic Felgrate. And in a quiet moment, Think of those known to us alone. We give thanks for all who look after them in hospital or at home. Give them the strength to carry on with their ministrations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our prayers are needed for all who have lost their lives through accident, disaster or conflict, and we ask you to comfort the bereaved. We commend to your safekeeping the souls of the recently departed, Leslie Anderson, Michael Townsend, Valda Ashton, Helga Griffiths, Ruth Clare and John Miller. And we remember those whose anniversaries fall at this time. Jenny Bramley, Linda Davis, Ellen Goodison, Dorothy Lambert, Rex Bull, Graham Lee, 
Peggy Whelan, Hazel Claxton, and John Harris. Rest eternal, grant unto them, O Lord, and let the light of their shall shine upon. God our Father, we can never thank you enough for your great love for us, made known in your Son, Jesus Christ. The love that freely forgives us and welcomes us into the family of your church. The love that watches over us day by day and will never let us go. The love that is stronger than death and from which nothing can separate us now or ever. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Mary Magdalene, St. George, St. James the Great, and all your saints, we commend ourselves and all peoples to your unfailing love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You stand for the peace. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. You can offer winks, smiles, and all those things. If you like to be seated just a moment. And on your uh, pew slip, you will see uh, the services for the week. Um, there is a, our usual morning Eucharist here on Wednesday at nine, and uh, at uh, on Saturday, unusually because we don't use the church very often, there will be morning prayer at eight o'clock in the lovely church at Narford which in eight years I've only been in two months, so I'm going to try and make it twice. <laughs> so it is very lovely, the setting is beautiful. And our main service next Sunday is at Castle Acre and morning praise at Hentney. Um, having had many weeks in a row now of wonderful weddings, we're going to start the next lot off because I have more bands. So I published the bands of marriage between James Anthony Painter of the parish of St. Peter and Paul Swaffham and Laura Kane Dean of the same parish. This is for the first time of asking if anyone knows a just cause in law why these two persons may not marry, you are to declare it now. Good. So there are no, oh, there is one other notice. Yes, it's not a notice. Um, Nigel Valder's son is going home um, in this coming week, so we want to wish you Godspeed and you will be in our prayers. We stand to sing our offertory hymn 152, Dear Lord and Father. <laughs>
ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ is God. Christ is with Christ will come. Father, we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. We remember his dying and rising in glory, and we rejoice that he intercedes for us at your right hand. Pour out your Holy Spirit as we bring before you these gifts of your creation. May they be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy things in your presence, form us in the likeness of Christ and build us into a living temple to your glory. Remember, Lord, your church in every land. Reveal her unity, guard her faith, and preserve her in peace. Bring us at the last to the Blessed Virgin Mary, to Mary Magdalene, to George, to James, the Great of all the saints, to the vision of that eternal splendor for which you have created us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom with all who stand before you in earth and heaven. We worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. <laughs>
Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. And though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. <laughs> The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The body of Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. <laughs> 
Thank you. 